This type of videos where we were customizing Reaper are very common in my channel, but I will also make a series on how to start with Reaper if you know nothing about it. Let's just jump into it and start customizing our toolbars. The whole idea is that there are certain actions that you will be using more than others, and it's easier to have them always at hand instead of learning even more shortcuts. Straight from Mexico City, my name is Juanchis, and let's customize our own toolbars. So I already have a video on how to customize the menus of different things. In this case are the send menus and I will link it in the description. But I will start talking about this toolbar. As you can see, I have two toolbars up top. I can change from 32 available toolbars and I've been trying to build my own toolbars according to my own workflow and my own needs. And you would usually only have one toolbar at hand. So I'm just going to right click position toolbar at top of main window and it's going to take advantage of this space and I will still have this one here. And up here, I'm going to build my own main floating toolbar and I call it that because those are the actions that I use the most. So I'll right click, I'll customize my toolbar. So this first action that's markers display, lets me toggle on and off markers so that they cross all over my project. Sometimes when I'm using a lot of markers, these get in the way because they usually look like this. They go all the way up, down, and sometimes I just want a big reference up top and I can toggle the, this right here. There's an action for that. Remember that all of the actions will be linked in the description of this video. This first one is display project regions markers as grid lines in a range view. Then I usually mess a lot with the grid when I'm working. I have a couple of shortcuts set up to command and control one to adjust it by two or divide it between two. But I like this right here because I can just left click it and look at my grid settings really fast if I'm not really sure of what I'm looking at. There's a lot to change right here if necessary. All of this menu is one click away instead of having to use one shortcut within my keyboard. Then the metronome because I use this a lot. Even though I have it on a shortcut M for toggling it on or off, I can right click it and it open up this menu right here where I can change the pattern itself. I can change the speed of it. I can change the samples that I use, etc., etc. So I have everything when I need to change something about my metronome again, one click away. On the visual side of the arrangement, I have this show pix display settings. And this one is really useful for me because it gives me a lot of information of whatever I'm watching. I can easily see the snares right here, the kicks, because there's a certain frequency amplitude related to what's being contained in the waveform. It's really helpful. It, it really helps me understand a problem faster if I'm not really sure what's going on. Most people like their peaks completely grayed out, uh, but I don't like that anymore. Like I really miss having spectral peaks at sight. But one feature that I use a lot is the spectrogram because sometimes there's something, there's a small noise that I can't find that I'm, that I'm sure that I'm listening, but I can't find it. So I can just try to narrow it down and see if it's actually happening. You can mess around with this, uh, shift up the frequency so you can see more of the lower register, more of the higher register, uh, change the intensity of the amplitude related. For example, whenever something is around minus 14, it's going to be yellow. So this is already kind of loud for I can increase the contrast or lower the contrast. But then again, it really comes with this. How much level does it have? And changing the brightness. I like to keep more or less like this contrast because it really helps me understand, for example, more, most of these purple things are more of an ambience than the drums themselves because the hits of the kick and the snare are these parts over here. Same right here. And you can even see here the ride or the symbol going on. So the peak display is something that I use a lot, a lot, a lot. Next, I'm using this track lock unlock track height action because sometimes you just want to keep a certain height, a certain size of your tracks when you're editing something. For example, you have, if I have to select these three tracks and I don't want to change the view and I always want to be able to see three tracks only without messing it up, I can just 
use the shortcut on my keyboard or click the track height lock and now I cannot change the height of those tracks that I selected. You might want to improve this shortcut by creating a new custom action, adding the select all tracks action and then the lock unlock track height. Just name your action something like height lock, search for it right here and I'll just change my keyboard shortcut and I'll add it to my toolbar right here and now I can delete this one again. I'll right click, text icon, height lock and I will make it twice the size so it's easy to read on my toolbar right here. I apply and there we go. So instead of just having one locked, I can run my shortcut and I unlock everything or I lock everything and I can't change them. Next, the locking MIDI items is really important because I have more than once misclicked and moved a little bit some MIDI item and that just means chaos in the project. So there's an action that toggles the locking of the MIDI items, but it goes along with the show lock settings. If you don't have anything locked or anything set up, this menu will come up and what I will only have set up as locked is to prevent the left and right movement so I don't displace time-wise anything. Those are the only things that I would really lock, but feel free to use whatever you might want to. Maybe you finished um, stretching and editing something, and you might also want to add this one to lock the stretch markers. So I don't click this one as much, but it's a visual reference. So when I hit L on my keyboard, I can always see when I'm locked or unlocked really easily. Next, I'm using track properties, free item positioning. And this one is really useful. I have showed it in other videos because it's faster to go right here instead of having to go into the track menu, finding free item positioning, especially for editing purposes. So let's suppose for a moment that I'm trying to replace this specific snare with something else. So I'll try and cut this one with cut at zero crossing action. I'm just going to copy this one. I'll select all of my item items, hit H to heal my media item. I will place my cursor right here. I'll paste it. Since I have locked my media item placement, I can just drag it down and try to really, really be sure that they are in the same spot. I click on lock, as you can see, and I just place it right, right where it should be. I just check my fade ins and my fade outs. I can mute this one up top. I can make something like this, something like this and something like this, and you have probably a really precise edit. <clears throat> I have a lot of examples of this on previous videos, so I won't insist on this. Then I have my track group setting at hand, because whenever you're grouping different tracks with action set track grouping parameters, remember that you can relate or link the behavior of certain actions, volume and mutes, that way whenever I move the fader of one, it moves the fader of the other. And you have these small ribbons that let you know that this grouping is activated. Sometimes the color is not as obvious. So I like having this extra reference that something is on or off for track grouping because sometimes I'm not sure. Then I have the tool item grouping and track media razor edits. This is really helpful because since we have this new media razor edit follows, you don't have to group both items hitting you on your keyboard, finding these link buttons. You can just have that set to on and you can just start editing a whole group without having to deal with more steps. So I have this one also right here and it's marked with these small ribbons at the edge of the track control panel. Next, I have the normalized items to peaks, loops, etc. And I use this one because sometimes as I said on the video of how to handle your sample library, you just need to bring everything down. So sometimes my mixing starting point, if the levels are not working just with the fader and things are hitting really, really high, I'd much rather just normalize every single thing to minus 12 around something like that peak. So I'm entering my nonlinear processing plugins in the right levels, so I can more or less have a better handling of my gain staging. Most of the times I will always use and normalize each item separately, but also when I'm checking some things and I'm 
playing back, for example, a master against a mix, and I just want to be sure that I'm not being deceived by volume. So I would normalize the loops integrated in case it's a whole mix and a whole master, but in the case of being small samples, I would only use the loops momentary. Loops momentary, I will usually set it up at minus 28, around that, and loops integrated, just because I don't want to hit zero inside Reaper, I would usually go around minus 16 or minus 18 even, just to have a lot of space and I can handle my levels from my Rednet X2P. Then I have this cycle ripple editing mode and it's reflected as off or applied to every single track. As you can see, different amount of squares light up when you have a single track or every single track set on. How this works is I use this mostly for video editing because I have some sort of multi-stream where I have, for example, here the video, here the audio of my microphone and here the audio of my computer. And if I'm cutting stuff with racer actions and just deleting it, I don't want this to end up like a big space and then having to manually pull things back together. So what I use is the ripple actions. If you're selecting all of them, it's not a problem. But if you're only selecting one, see that only one of them moves and shifts to the left. Since I don't want to risk it because sync problems are a big issue, I'd rather just cut one single media item and everything cuts together. This next action, I have been using it a lot, a lot, a lot, and I keep turning it on and off because sometimes I'm just checking one hit of something or one section, and I don't want to keep on hitting play and pause all of the time. And it's this action, toggle stop playback at end of loop if repeat is disabled. Remember that the repeat button is up here. And for example, let's suppose that you're only trying to know how this snare sounds from here to here. I'm going to set it up with two markers, time select by double clicking between two markers, turn this off, turn on the stop play at selected loop and listen. I can actually look for anything that could be going wrong only in that range without having to pass everything or mute whatever is after. Same thing goes on if I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with my kick and I just double click. Or I can just select a small section like this. Uh, or you can just grab a time selection coming from one section into another. Listen to the transition and see if it works. This is really useful to have always at hand. This next section is for finding sometimes the media item inside your computer. And I have it named as item in finder. And it's really simple. I just assigned an icon to it because I just click it and then it brings me straight into the folder that has that. I'll do it again. I just click the media item that I'm looking for in my computer, left click, and it shows. That's useful. The next one is more for an educational purpose because I don't use it too much on my daily studio life. It's this package from the Rea Pack called Music Math BPM Pitch to Milliseconds and Hertz Converter. What it does is it can help you get the time exactly of a certain subdivision, or you can look for the exact frequency of a certain note within in its own octave. Again, this is something that I use a lot more for educational purposes. I pretty much don't use it whenever I'm doing my own studio work. This one I remember finding out, I think it was in a Reaper block video, the set block buffer size. It's useful. I don't need to lower the latency on my on Reaper very often, uh, but you can just click it and change the block size of your audio interface. It's really nice to have it at hand. Next, I have the solo in front. This is something that I missed from Pro Tools. Uh, one of the few things that I actually missed from Pro Tools is to be able to hit solo on one track. And whenever that track is soloed, what would happen is that if in the usual playback, you will have something like this and hitting solo on one track would basically mute the other two, right? This is what you would usually happen. But with a solo dim, what really happens is that you can set up how much the other tracks will dim or go down. So you can have this in the foreground and listen carefully to whatever you need to listen in case you need to zoom into something really fast, listen to it and then go back without losing context. And whenever you unsolo, everything will look again like this or sound again like this. 
And the last two are Toggle Smooth Seek. And what this does is that whenever you're playing a certain, whenever you're in playback mode and you click up here, it's going to wait for the bar or the time to go around, for example, time one, quarter two, quarter three, for it to change to the new place within the arrangement. Or if it's off, it's just going to jump immediately. Sometimes that continuous sense of landing in the time helps the ear not crashing and trying to figure out what went wrong and you can really concentrate on what you need to. So sometimes I'm using this on, sometimes I'm using this off. Especially when you're checking section to section, you might want it to be right on the beat and not like just some click that comes out of nowhere. And last but not least, the Paranormal FX Router. So I haven't used this as much as I would like to because I don't know my my way of dealing with creative signal workflow hasn't taken advantage of this. I do most of the things within the mixer using sends and returns, but this is a topic that a lot of users in Reaper 7 have been talking about. So it's also nice to have it right at hand because it also helps me explain some signal flows of certain things and how to do them fast. So that's a big list of things to start working on. And those are actions that I really use on pretty much any kind of session that I'm doing. Again, I really invite you or entice you to start thinking about what kind of work you're doing the most. For example, whenever you're editing, because maybe you're editing a podcast or something, what kind of actions do you always need? So for example, when I'm doing YouTube editing, I will always do these actions in this order. I will create some regions with the names of the videos and they are set in order. I will split the file into multi-stream so I get the video, the audio, etc. I will set up to random color so I will always have a visual reference of what is what. I will lock the height cycle. I will insert the template because I'm working with a couple of FX and that just makes my life easier level-wise. And then I can just show the region matrix window so I can select what I'm rendering from where and this last action is also from the package and this last action is also just from the RIA pack and it's called export markers as you took time code for video description and it takes all of the markers with their own name and it puts a timestamp to them. So yes, sometimes taking some time to start building your own custom toolbars will help you do the same process faster and faster. I know I say fast a lot in this YouTube channel, but let's start wasting less time in things that don't really matter and let's concentrate on what we really want to get out of something like Reaper uh, just as a creative output. <clears throat> if you like this kind of videos, be sure to comment, like, subscribe, comment, and do all of those things that people on YouTube say. Straight from Mexico City, my name is Juanchis and thanks for listening.